In his younger days, Hamilton had cut a girlish figure, wasp-waisted, slim-limbed, with none of the manly chest you'd associate with an orator who could dominate a hall for hours. He'd had a dancer's grace, too, pirouetting and gesturing as he kept up an endless stream of talk. No one had ever talked as much as Hamilton. The world might have drowned in his words. Now it was only the talk anyone remembered. At 49, he'd aged noticeably, thickened up, slowed. Even his electric violet-blue eyes had dimmed, like a fire that had burned down to embers. And his hair, once a lustrous strawberry blonde, a token of his Scottish heritage, it was said, had gone pale and brittle. But Hamilton still wore it straight back, clasped in his trademark club behind. America was still a thinly populated country of only a few million free whites, most of them clumped in a few cities from Georgia to the Massachusetts coast that was not yet called Maine. If the elite weren't related by blood or marriage, they'd served together in the war or gone to college together. So here, Hamilton knew Kent from his earliest days as a lawyer, and he knew Van Rensselaer because Van Rensselaer was married to Hamilton's wife's sister. But, of course, familiarity doesn't always guarantee warmth. Among intimates, a slight can cause a cooling, and then chill into an icy fury, and so the political world of the young America was driven by the dual polarities of Anton Mesmer, the German physician who believed that everyone and everything is held together by a magnetic force. Those who loved, loved like newlyweds. Those who hated, hated like demons. Thinking he was among men he loved and who loved him, Hamilton ventured an opinion of a man he didn't. When questioned about Burr's candidacy for governor of New York, Hamilton was dismissive, but, being Hamilton, he expressed himself with memorable acuity. He said that he found Burr to be dangerous. He said other things, too, but that was the only one that mattered.